So welcome to Game Plan Sunday. Today is December 12, 2021. Here with another session this week here. Um, pretty interesting. What we saw last week was some dip buying pop-offs, uh, a miss of some inflationary data that just, you know, wasn't good. So uh, the markets is going to be, you know, digesting the Fed's decision coming this week. Uh, but last week, they kind of shrugged it off a little bit, and we saw some dip buying, basically. That's what occurred. I'm just taking a look here. At the results of last week's session, <clears throat> we had a lot of green on the map here. Oil rallied back up 8.67%. The Dow Jones went up 4.02%. The ES or the SP 500, 3.82%. The NASDAQ was up 3.61%. The Russell even came back 2.43%. Gold slightly down, negative 0.04%. The dollar was slightly down, negative 0.11%, and Bitcoin was down, negative 10.78%. Now, that's not good to be dropping, you know, 10% in a week. So, again, you better make sure you got your diamond hands. If you're trying to play the Bitcoin crypto game, you got to have a good stomach for that. You feel me? But, um, yeah, that was interesting. But for the most part, we saw equities have a nice little bounce back amidst of, you know, data that should have been bad. Um, the technology sector was up 5.9%. The energy sector was uh, up 3.81%. Consumer staples up 3.66%. That's some good plays over there this past week. Uh, materials up 3.5%. Healthcare, 3.23%. Industrials up 3.08%. Real estate was up 2.89%. Financials was up 2.68%, tied with communications. And uh, consumer discretionary, 2.67. And utilities, up 2.6%. So we had a pretty nice green week last week. So that was good uh, for the markets. And again, if you guys are just logging in, I'm a little bit under the weather. So excuse the deep voice. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to put my radio voice on, but I'm trying to overcome this little bug that you know my daughter passed over to me. You know how it is with kids, man. They don't know about social distancing. They got to be hugging all over you, kissing on you, talking all in your face, knowing they got a bug. But I'm here trying to, you know, weather it through. And I want to make sure I gave us a good session here this week. Uh, try to keep it short and, and snappy here for you guys. So, But uh, some of the main things that, you know, went down last week for the main part was, you know, the CPI data that came out. We definitely got to get into that. And... Um, let me see what else we had on the headlines before we even get into the CPI, because it's a lot of information that came from that. Then we had a China Evergrande situation as well. Uh, Terry posted this China Evergrande shares plunge as it teeters on brink of default. All right. So the housing market in China is just not doing good. All right. I mean, this point blank period. It's not doing good. Evergrande, this situation is going to take some time to be able to go through. But it's going to have some economic fallout that's just not going to be good. All right. Um, and so there's nothing really much to talk about on that except for just watching them trying to wind this thing down. And they're trying to wind it down without, you know, causing destruction. But I think it's going to cause, you know, much more destruction uh, in China's real estate market. But that was a good one. Um, let's see. OK, we caught some of that. Let's just go ahead and jump straight into it because I don't think we posted much in here except for that CPI data. So uh, let's just jump into it here. Consumer price index, the all index, uh, the all items index rose 6.8% for the 12 months ending in October, which is the largest 12 month increase since the period ending June, 1982. So this is the highest reading from the CPI since June, 1982. Now we've been telling you guys inflation is problematic, you know, since the beginning of this year, um, and the feds, they've been denying it. And then they started to change things, move the goalposts, say that it was transitory and uh, elongated transitory and, and, and all kind of just crazy terms that they just put out here. But this is basically what it looks like. So you guys can understand what's going on. <clears throat> well, you can see that from November of 2020, this is last year. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Under the weather here. And where we are today. All right. So well, it's probably higher now We're in the month of December, but this is the, the last reading. So you guys can clearly see, you know, this is what's happening to our purchasing power. 
All right. Uh, inflation is super high, almost 7%. Now, this is the CPI number. Some people call it the CP lie number. There's a reason why they call it the CP lie number because it's not the same, you know, uh, CPI that they had in the 70s, the way that they used to account for it. They changed the numbers. They changed the way that they account for, you know, the calculation for it in a way that kind of keeps inflation like bogged down to make it seem like it's low. But in reality, if they were to measure this the same way they used to measure it in the 70s, this number will be over 10 percent. So inflation this is why you hear people saying inflation is actually higher than the government's number. These government numbers are, you know, to benefit the government's, you know, programs that they got going on. So uh, but that's what the uh, this was the report that came out. And you guys can check it right here. It says that the. Uh, CPI increased 0.8%, all index increased 6.8%, energy index rose 3.5%, the November gasoline index increased 6.1%, food, in, uh, food index increased 0.7%, food at home rose 0.8%, and then down here you see the all items index rose 6.8%, which so we covered cover earlier, we told you guys about that. So it's the largest increase since 1982. And so, but you see how the trickery that they do when they drop it, they just give you these little percentages, like, oh, 0 0.8. They don't really mean nothing when you see the chart like that. You know what I'm saying? But in reality, it's 6.8%. That's that's basically what, what's happening here. Um, that's for the whole 12 months. That's when they average it all out. But um, this is actually problematic in lots of ways, though. So the CPI is going up higher. We're in a higher inflationary environment. There is no transitory. We talked about it uh, last week with Powell, you know, retired the term transitory. <clears throat> and this is going to be an important number coming into this week, uh, because this week we're expecting for the Fed, you guys can see on the calendar here, the FOMC meeting right there. Uh, it's going to be this week. And so the markets is going to be anticipating, you know, the feds to start to do their taper thing um, so that they can start raising rates. Now, the question is, will they raise rates? Can they raise rates? Right now, that's all the chatter. The chatter is that they can, they're, they're going to raise rates. Um, and I'm going to show you guys something real quick. It's called the Fed Watch Tool. And it's right here. <clears throat> I took a little snippet of it. So this Fed Watch Tool, you can get the probability of, you know, um, the probabilities of the Fed's raising rates. Okay. And so we go here. And we check in the future. We check all the different probabilities. And so we take a look at what's the highest probabilities. But we go to these different date sets, December, January, March, May, <coughs> excuse me, June. So you can go into time and it'll let you know, you know, what they are projecting. So this is the, for the 4th of May, 2022. And what you're looking for is the highest probability. So we find... They got like these three different sets, well, four. And you take a look at what's the highest probability. So in this case, 44% is the highest. And so remember, this is where we are right now. We are here right now, 0% interest rate. And so they are expecting them to raise it, you know, by a quarter basis point. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's this is how you read that, okay? So we're looking at the, you know, the markets are anticipating when we say the markets. So the markets are anticipating the feds to hike these rates by May of next year, um, which from the last FOMC meeting, I believe they was talking about um, going ahead and getting rid of, you know, uh, loading off the balance sheet before then and talking about raising rates around June timeframe. And now you can see here it's starting to change, you know, the trajectory here uh, for May. This this all changes in real time. So this is something that you guys get familiar with the Fed Watch tool and check it like every week <clears throat> or at least once a month. And you'll see, you know, what what's the anticipation for. But basically, the Fed's balance sheet, where they're talking about winding down, they're still doing quantitative easing, but they're talking about not spending so much into the uh, economy. So they've been cutting back how much they're spending in the economy. And remember, we had this huge growth uh, rebound because the feds don't want deflation. So we had the shortest recession ever in history and it was popped out of it because they pumped it full of liquidity. All right. So they pumped all this money in there to stop it. 
And then um, here we are out of the recession, but look like we're getting ready to head into another recession because they are slowing down the money that they're putting in the system and they plan on moving completely out so they can raise the rates. All right. So this real earning situation here is important too, because <clears throat> the real average hourly earnings decreased 1.9%. This came out also <clears throat> at the same time as the CPI, but the CPI is a more important number than this. <clears throat> but when you look at it, <clears throat> what it's basically telling you is that inflation is taking away the amount of money that people are, it's eating away the money that people are making. So even though people are making higher wages, if you're not outpacing inflation, <clears throat> it's going to cut into your spending. Okay. And so what they're showing is that over time, when you look at this chart, you can see this. You don't need to be a map genius to notice that you have less positive reads <clears throat> than you have negative readings. All right. So you got four positives, you got eight negatives. <clears throat> So that tells you right there, that's the one point, the negative 1.9%. So wages are not outpacing inflation. This is problematic <clears throat> because it could actually slow, well, it will slow down people's spending. And so I wrote this in here so you guys can understand how to read this thing as well. It says that real earnings measures the change in worker earnings after adjusting for inflation. If income fails to grow at or above the rate of inflation, the people have less to spend on food, clothing, vacations, and gasoline. This results in lower living standards and discontented consumers. Labor unrest might follow as workers demand more pay to offset the corrosive effects of higher prices. So if you're looking in the media, <clears throat> you'll see that's what's happening currently right now, right? Labor unrest. You got all kind of, you know, people striking, union members are striking. People want more money, need to make more money because the cost of living is getting unbearable. The CPI numbers doesn't reflect it accurately. That's why I say the numbers don't mean anything. The cost of rent, the cost of mortgage, cost of everything is super high. Food is super high. Energy is super high and it's going to continue to get higher. So it's important that you outpace the rate of inflation because if not, inflation is going to make you more poor. So <clears throat> with the unrest, you don't want to see that in a society because, again, these are some of the ingredients that destroys the fabrics of society itself, you know, in this nation. It can really go down. So, but that's pretty much what I have to say about that. This is a good chart so you guys can understand about the purchasing power of a dollar, how it decreases over time because of inflation. As you can see, this chart tracked the dollar back in the 70s, okay? And you hear about the 70s inflationary period, which the inflation in the 70s was stupid dumb high. And I think it got up to like 13% uh, by 1980 was the highest. So this is why you hear a lot of people talking about <clears throat> this period uh, seeming like the 70s because inflation was so high, it was killing the dollar, all right? value of the dollar went down extremely sharp and then it starts to slow but this is where we are right now all right <clears throat> and so you're looking at about 20 cents or a little less than 20 cents on your dollar that's how much the dollar is worth that's how much purchasing power it has left in it and so um these are things that we talk about when we're talking about these cycles and uh Ray Dalio's uh, new book, <clears throat> The Changing World Order, Why Nations Succeed and Fail. <clears throat> He's been, you know, working on this for about two years now. Finally came out. Told you guys, make sure you cop this book <clears throat> so you can, you know, get your understanding of currencies and stuff like that. <clears throat> Especially you guys that want to do currency trading. It's a lot of, you know, promo groups out there trying to get you into Forex and stuff like that, but Half those guys don't even understand how currencies work. 
I think it's important that you understand, especially if you want to trade, <clears throat> you need to understand it. But you can see, you know, the dollar is, is falling. OK. And uh, this happens over and over in cycles throughout history from the beginning of time. And Ray Dalio, he basically went did, and did the homework on it. <clears throat> now, he's not the only person that's done homework, but his, his, his body of work is, is pretty good to get a, a good understanding of what's happening. <clears throat> and in fact, I captured this interview that Dalio did uh, for Barron's, which he's in the Ledges and Gurus group. He says that the chronic U.S. deficits could lead to an inflationary spiral where Treasury buyers lose confidence. So bond buyers <clears throat> no longer going to buy bonds. The Federal Reserve must create vast amounts of new money to sop up Treasury supply. So the only buyers of bonds is going to be the Federal Reserve. They're going to print money. They're going to buy them. The fact that the U.S. inflation rate just hit a 39-year high makes this a timely message. So they say Ray Dalio's right on time. Now, actually, Dalio's been talking about this for like the past two years. But here we are. <clears throat> Doves say that some inflationary factors will pass and that yields on Treasury inflation protected securities, which are tips, imply five-year inflation averaging 2.8%, well below the latest <clears throat> reading of 6.8%. Dalio says to avoid cash and to prefer and prefer tips to nominal treasuries. See, <clears throat> this is the financial engineering that they do with numbers. And that's why you just can't put too much trust in these numbers because they like to average things out to try to smooth the data to make it seem like it's not as bad. So that's what they're talking about. They're looking at averaging like oh, it's five year. <clears throat> Sometimes they do like 10 year averages and they want this to be like two point something. Although inflation is well over 10%, but they'll put the feed out. Oh, inflation is it's like 2.8%. This is manageable. <clears throat> this is financial engineering, bro. That's all they do with the numbers. Same thing like Einstein used to do with numbers. They do the same stuff. It's engineering. Don't make nothing real. <clears throat> then Dalio's talking about a civil war in the U.S. All right. And he says, he tried to clarify. Say he's talking about polarity. <clears throat> where he's talking about extremes, where you have extreme left, extreme right. <clears throat> and these are the ingredients that could turn into a civil war. Now, being familiar with his work over time, these are the things that he see happen over and over and, and, and you know, throughout societies, empires and kingdoms. When you have <clears throat> the wealth gaps that get so large. And right now we have a crazy wealth gap. I just had somebody on Facebook that was asking me about <clears throat> inflation. I was explaining to him how the feds, the government and the feds, they make the rich richer. And, you know, their policies, they claim that they're combating the rich, but in really in reality, they're making them more wealthy. And they don't care either because they have assets as well. So they're getting richer. You know, uh, these Democratic senators, Nancy Pelosi, they got, you know, mansions, bro. <clears throat> their houses are increasing in value. You think they care? No, they don't care because they have assets. In fact, they own stocks. They own a lot of stocks. So because when they print money and they do these inflationary policies, it benefits asset owners. Non-asset owners are at the detriment, okay? They don't benefit. So if you don't have stocks, you don't have real estate, you don't have any assets, you're done. That's what we keep on telling you, but that's their only answer. The government's only answer <clears throat> is to, you know, print money. They don't want to tax because, you know, that can cost them an election. So you just inflate it away and just blame it on capitalism. You see, it's just, you know, politically expedient. All right. So he's talking about the Civil War. Then the last one he's talking about is war with China. He's talking about China's a great place to invest. But, you know, times are changing. Things are getting real. I know I'm a little under the weather, so try not to keep it too long, though. But anyway, some good information on here that we had on this article here, it was talking about Alibaba, and I wanted to cover that. It said, the problem is that U.S. buyers of Alibaba shares aren't getting Alibaba. So you ain't buying Alibaba, but rather a Cayman Island shell company with a contractual relationship with Alibaba. China has soured 
on letting its companies use that loophole to pursue capital abroad. <clears throat> and U.S. regulators don't like the risk of arbitrary actions from China. When Didi Global, the Uber of China, recently said it would delist from New York Stock Exchange to pursue a listing in Hong Kong, its shares fell more than 20% in a day. So I thought that was pretty juicy information for you guys. Uh, but again, this is uh, under Ray Dalio's profile under the Legends of Gurus. All right, taking a look at the S&P 500 chart on the weekly here. Uh, when we swung from this low to this high, we got this extension right here. We see price rejected here, <clears throat> fell to the 20, and then bounced back from here. Now it's pushing this level again. It looks like we may get a breach through here to go higher. On a daily chart, we can see a squeeze, and we also have a buy trigger as well. This is a squeeze on a daily. Trend is moving up. Momentum is going up. Buy trigger says up. Pushing against this resistance right here across. Is it enough to get us pushed through? I believe we will get some push through. Next target at 4,800. Dustin, you think it's going to be a double top? It could be. It could be. <clears throat> but I will bet that it will pop through to at least <clears throat> get some suckers in before it break down. But as of right now, don't quite see the double top yet because I think we get a, I think we get a push through this resistance zone. But what could turn this into a double top? The meeting with the Fed this week. I think that <clears throat> a lot of the movement that's gonna push it through the zone is going to be from uh, before the Fed's meeting. I think we can get some uh, some action, good action before the Fed meeting. <clears throat> and I think the markets probably get choppy as we head into the Fed meeting, but we'll see. Uh, but I think that we can get some new highs this week, though. We got some resistance on the Fibonacci from this swing high to this low. Extensions come up here. <clears throat> and we see I respect that. This could turn into a head and shoulders, <clears throat> but... Maybe not. We do have a squeeze in here, so it's going to be a big move. Um, it could be a big move. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure if we can breach this level here, which is the 16.5 level. It's right here ahead of the Fed's meeting. But <clears throat> it's highly probable. I mean, if we do, this is what we'll look at. We'll take a look at Swing from this high to this low to get some new levels. And then you look at that 17,000. <clears> that will be the next zone. Okay. But again, I think this is really going to depend on outcome of the feds. And let's take a look at oil. We had a nice drop in oil all the way down here. Now price is bouncing back. Got a little bull flag in here that's forming. You can see that right there. So I think this is going to go uh, north. You can see the trend is going up, momentum shifting. <clears throat> but keep in mind, it's got to clear this 100 moving average. But I think we at least get the push up to it uh, where we can at least test it. <clears throat> Don't know if it will clear it, but that seems to be a pretty good zone for the uh, oil. And what else? Let me just take a look at a couple of names here. <clears throat> and we could take a look at some stocks you guys want to take a look at. And we bring the session to a close because I'm over here struggling, you know, with this bug over here battling. But I've <clears throat> been playing slow and steady this week. Slow and steady over in Procter and Gamble this week. Consumer stocks have been moving pretty good. This setup was pretty easy to see because it was a multi timeline uh, time frame squeeze so what we saw on a weekly chart we saw the weekly squeeze in here right here boom then you dial into the daily and you had a daily squeeze in there boom 
So whenever you get, you know, compressed squeezes like that, <clears throat> that's where you want to be at. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty much what I was playing this week was Procter & Gamble. Some really good plays right there. But that's the reason why I saw the multi squeeze and, you know, it's, it's still pushing. And it's just fired off here on a daily. Two green dots, one green dot here on the weekly chart. <clears throat> so it fires off on the inside and then it comes out. And that's what we're seeing right here. So it's got some potential to go higher, uh, but I'm already out with the bag. So cool. If you're in there, still got some upside, probably to about 160. But that's a good one right there. Um, and in fact, let me take a look at some of these sectors real quick. This is the consumer staple sector. You can see that squeeze right there, that weekly squeeze in there. It's pretty strong, but we got squeezes on the sectors, right? On the indexes. So we got squeezes on the indexes, got squeezes on these sectors. And so again, it's like the squeeze within the squeeze type setup. Squeezes here. Got some trend follow up up. And I mean, this is here is almost getting ready to hit the 127 extension. So if you're already in, you'll be exiting out at that first level, at least some of it. And then you can come up to 75, 76 or whatever. That's on the sector itself. Just looking at some of the names in that sector, they should move with it. All right. Um, also, also utilities is starting to move higher. Uh, got a little buy trigger on that. And I think this is, see the little buy trigger right there. And it's starting to move up. <clears throat> I think this is more of safety, moves into safety. Just, you know, in case, you know, whatever the Fed is going to do, they want to get some safety pop off. And you can see on a daily chart how it's starting to rise higher. Okay. So normally they play utilities as a proxy to bonds. <clears throat> All right, and then Dustin says forward. Yeah, this one here had a really nice move on it. <clears throat> really nice move on it. It's still in the squeeze formation. And I don't think I can get some good levels on it though. Let me see. All right, from this high to this low. All right, but it's still in the squeeze. So it means Squeeze hasn't fired off yet. And should it continue to rise higher to squeeze? Because that was an explosive move in that one day right there. Got that trigger. So this thing continues to move up. <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised if it blows up to at least about $25. That'd be great. But yeah, definitely bullish on it. But whenever you get these moves so high, you want to see how it's going to behave the next day. Is it going to start trading sideways here, start to drop a little bit, shake some people out, and then move higher. So kind of like a, a bull flag of type uh, that could form on it. So that's the type of stuff that you want to look at on that particular chart to see if it holds this, this zone right here, uh, starting on tomorrow. All right, and then it's an XLV. Oh, Pfizer, okay. <clears throat> The Rona stocks. Yeah. So I don't really know how I feel about these Rona stocks. Let's see. All right. And the reason I said that is because this Omicron situation looks like it's not as bad as they were thinking it's going to be. And so, I mean, if it's bad, then I think that'll help these stocks. But if it's not, I don't think it's really going to help them. So. But you can see how I respect the Fibonacci very well. Now it's trading at the 20, <clears throat> moving average. And it's in a squeeze here, so it's going to be important to see how it plays. It's struggling right now against the mean, so I don't have a, a quite direction on it. I just know, like, right now, that red line, that moving average, if it trades under that, it's short. Right now, it's got to work itself above it. And I don't know if it's going to do a good job of that. <clears throat> The news of this Omicron variant uh, just don't, you know, take shape of anything, much of anything. So, but again, y'all know I don't really do the biotech stocks like that. So I'll let y'all play with that. 
Uh, Dustin says against the sector. Okay. Yeah, so taking a look at the sector itself. All right. If you're looking at, so Dustin's idea is to play the name that's in the sector itself, which is, you know, one of our strategies that we like to play. <clears throat> Swinging from here. They're here. We got a 786 cat right here. This is resistance. It's not a strong level of resistance, but it is a resistance. So we saw it got rejected in the past. Question is, will it hold true on this one here? We got a buy trigger that says get in. <clears throat> but you're going to need something to push it. It's in the squeeze. Everything is looking bullish on here. So now this is the 100% right here, which I don't have present here, but it's about 137. <clears throat> so if it does push through, next level will be here before it climbs to the 127.2. So if you're looking to play, you know, anything, I guess in the, in the healthcare sector, that's what you're looking at. Um, yeah. But again, I think they benefit if more bad news about these variants and virus continues but if they start to die down i don't think it's gonna hold long so we'll see all right um caterpillar so this one here is trading under the uh, 100 moving average <clears throat> so it looks like a more of a counter trend type situation that you're looking at it does have a buy trigger right here <clears throat> but this 100 moving average is a strong level and it's right on it so it could push through it and then you got this 200 moving average. These are the two key levels that you need to, that it needs to push through. Now, counting trend trades, a little harder to get them to go through, but it could, okay? So we see it fall from here, come back to resistance, trying to form a little flag like this. Could it push through higher? Yeah, <clears throat> it could. But I wouldn't put a lot on it just because it's counter trend, unless it breaks this. If, if it breaks this, then yeah, you're good. I think if it breaks this here, then, I mean, you want to look at this 6182 right here, the 618 level. So you can get a push into here. And then the ultimate level will be this 200 moving average right here. So that's where I would look at that. Um, if you're playing that to the long side. Obviously, if it breaks, Chris, you will know what to do with that. You know, you like the short king, so. All right. And then. <laughs> and then um, looking at uh, Boeing and the airlines. <clears throat> oh, this is tough. So airline stocks um, don't do well with variants, <clears throat> you know, virus news, anything dealing with the virus stuff. Yeah, anything doing with the virus stuff wouldn't benefit these airline stocks. So I wouldn't want to touch them. Um, as you see, the Omicron situation got this thing wrecked down here. Then it starts to lighten up <clears throat> when, you know, they say, oh, the Omicron is not, not that bad. So then it starts to rally back up right into the 20 and the 50. But now it's starting to kind of dip down. I could come back down here. If, again, if this Omicron situation gets worse, I would be short these airline stocks. <clears throat> but again, if the Omicron is not as bad as they say it is, yeah, you may get some chop sideways to north. But uh, airlines is no place I want to be right now because they're too sensitive to this virus stuff. All right, what else we got? Anything else? Y'all know I'm over here hacking up. ATVI, <clears throat> Activision. <clears throat> yeah. Activision, this is the company that makes the video game Call of Duty. Um, They just released a new map that the kids are playing now. I don't think they're receiving it well, but from what I know, Activision is... Man, they got some issues, actually. <clears throat> so it looks like they have fired or laid off a bunch of people. And you guys can see, I mean, they, they've been getting wrecked. Um, and if you take a look, I mean, this is from the early this year, from $100 all the way down here. So it's half of its value 
you know, just destroyed. But they got people that's going on strike. You know, their workers are going on strike about this thing. So it's not looking good. <clears throat> and normally these video game companies make their money in the Christmas holidays because most parents is buying the new consoles and the new games. But they got shortages out here. So I don't really know how this is going to play out. And I haven't seen a time like this ever in my life, actually. So we'll see how it plays out. But if you ask me, it's looking pretty oversold. <clears throat> now, it could go down further. Let's actually go out a little further. Weekly, yeah. So just taking a look at this weekly chart here. Let's see. We can get a level right down here. So you can get a level right here around 50 bucks. So these bright red candlesticks you see on the chart, <clears throat> these are normally like reversals. They normally do this reversal thing. Uh, but we'll see how it plays because they didn't fizz out, you know, much on this chart here. So, but I, you know, just looking at it, it looks oversold if you ask me. However, I think it can come down to 50 though. So we'll see if the dip buyers are ready to jump in now or they're going to wait till they hit this 50. I mean, this 50, I might be a buyer of this. If this shit hit $50, I think I probably want to add that. Add the stocks into the portfolio. That's a, I mean, you can see the value. That's that's cheap as hell. <clears throat> these video game stocks, they're gonna do what they do, man. You know, Roblox and all these kids playing the games. You know, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, so Chris, again, I think it's oversold. I mean, we can take a look at the RSI. It's oversold. Momentum is hasn't shifted yet, but it's definitely oversold. Um let me uh put this back here. So yeah, it's definitely oversold. Now, I wouldn't want to short it while it's in you know oversold territory. So, but again, if it goes down to fifty, it's gonna be hella dip buying on this bad boy. Yes, sir. All right, and Ron, Ron said he's watching XLF. Oh, okay, my man Ron B. Uh, again, man, I'm under the weather here, so y'all thank you for bearing with me, man. <clears throat> All right, um, XLF. All right, so yeah, I mean, this is moving higher. Um, it's reverted, you know, back to the 20. You see that 20 is holding up pretty good on this one. That's right here. So you want to see it, you know, continue to hold up against that 20. So right here would be the dip buy. So every time you see it hits that 20, the dip buyers, they come in, right? Boom. Boom. So the question is, are the dip buyers going to return <clears throat> on this one here? On a daily chart, it's not looking too strong, if you ask me. But, I mean, yeah, it can swing it from this high to this low. Got some strong resistance right here at this $40, around this $40 area. But then you got, you know, this that's pointing downward. So I, I don't have no confidence in it just yet. We have to see how it plays out. See? Um, it's right up against that area. So, but again, it ripped all the way down here and it bounced up in here. Could it be trying to form one of those little, bit, you know, uh, like a bull, a bull trap thing? <clears throat> then go up. It can go either way on here. What I want to see on this is that it clears, you know, Clears this forty dollar mark, man. Um, if not, like I say, and you should get a signal on this earlier this week. You know, by Tuesday, it should give us a better, you know, insight of the direction it's going to take. So, I will probably wait it out Monday, then Tuesday have a better idea. No, actually, excuse me, I'm looking at the techno. This is the financial stuff. I think this is going to move after the Fed's meeting. Actually, it's all about the money. And then uh, Cigna. This is another one that's right up against that strong resistance level, that 100 moving average. You guys can see that right there. <clears throat> the trend is actually going up. Momentum's reversing. Um, but does it have enough in the tank to push through this 100 moving average? Another key level here, the 200, you know, the 200 moving average right here, about $230. If it should break, 
<clears throat> this uh, the ceiling, then you can see it move upwards. But if it doesn't hold this 100 moving average, then you know what to do. It'll start to chop a little bit. You see it chop sideways and start to go down. Then you'll know to, to go ahead and take that short on that. But the key thing is to see if it's going to hold this 100 moving average. That's the key thing on that one. All right. <clears throat> Anything else for anybody else? Because I need to hang it up, gang. Uh, make sure y'all, you know, cop the, the Ray Dalio book if you're interested in, you know, <clears throat> changing world orders, dynasties, empires. You know, he covers like gold currencies and stuff like that, like over history, over time. Uh, that actually covers all of that. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if you guys know about Louis von Mises, but you see this book right here is probably one of the greatest books ever written by any human being. <laughs> So if you're looking to have a book, you see I got all kind of little markers in my study. I got my little highlighter deck. That's ghetto, right? Topaz, I don't want to hear about it, Topaz. I know it's ghetto. All right. So, but anyway, this is like one of the greatest books ever written. Add it to your library. It covers like everything. So you got guys like Dalio to come out, you know, he act like he discovered all this stuff. He actually didn't. Stuff has already been discovered. You would tap into this stuff that was written like way back in the 20s and the 40s. He would have learned it. Uh, but ahead of his time, but I appreciate his, his research, his insights. He had his team to go do it. It looks great. So, you know, make sure you guys cop that. You know, that's what I'm reading right now. So um, get caught up on that. And then, uh, you know, we'll catch up, man. Ron said, I never want to stop talking. That's why I'm over here coughing because I want to talk. Um, but anyhow, let me get off this line. I appreciate you guys uh, hanging in here with me. And um, we'll catch you in the chat room this week. Peace.